Thanks for joining us this week, and welcome to Mutuality Matters, a podcast hosted by CBE International, where our mission is to promote the biblical message that God calls women and men of all cultures, races, and classes to share authority equally in service and leadership in the home, church, and world. Let's get into this week's episode. Welcome to this episode of Intersectionality. We are your hosts, Reverend Liz Testa and myself, Dr. Angela Raven Anderson. And in this segment, we explore how our understanding of God and who God is calling us to be is informed at the intersection of race, gender, and religion. We examine how the combination of liberation, womanist, and egalitarian theology presents an understanding of God's kingdom that embraces, restores, uplifts, and transforms all who would enter therein. When we consider and learn from the wisdom gained in the lived experiences of women in color, women of color, our view of God's kingdom is stretched, contextualized, enriched, and expanded. Let's listen to their voices as they move us beyond the stained glass ceiling. This week, we have a special guest with us and a historic moment as well. (laughs) We are having our very first first male guest. And so Liz is going to introduce our guest for today. Yes, Dr. Angela, it's so exciting, right? To be making herstory history. That's uh, it. So yes, yeah, so I'm so excited to introduce to our listeners uh, a good friend and colleague of mine, good brother in the Lord. And, um, and again, our historical first man to come and be our guest here. This is the Reverend uh, Dwayne Jackson. I'm going to tell you a little bit about him, friends. He's born and raised as a son of the Mott Haven Reformed Church in New York City. He has served in the role of deacon there, then as an elder, where he worked with the Finance Committee, Youth Ministry, Sunday School, Christian Education, Choir, and Men's Ministry. Good training ground, clearly. Uh, His educational accomplishments include a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering from New York Institute of Technology with a minor in Computer Science, and then a Master of Divinity from New York Theological Seminary here in New Brunswick, New Jersey. Reverend Duane was invited to serve as a student pastor for the First Reformed Church of Astoria, Queens, New York, following his ordination in January of 2000. He accepted the call to continue as their minister of word and sacrament, where he remained until June of 2017. In the community of Astoria and Long Island City, Queens, Reverend Jackson served as the clergy liaison for the local police command. His work involved mediation between members of the community and helping them to build a peaceful relationship that will benefit both the local citizens and the patrol officers where mutual respect is fostered. Can I get an amen? Amen. Reverend Jackson provided spiritual guidance and assistance for the members of the Astoria Senior Citizen Center and mentored young children, teens, and young adults at the local community center. Reverend Jackson has uh, served in a number of capacities in the Reformed Church in America at the denominational level. He has been part of the African-American Black Council in a number of capacities. He served the Reformed Church in America on staff as the coordinator of social witness and social justice. And he also has served on the Reformed Church in America's Commission for Women, which has eight spots, two of which are earmarked for our male allies. So thank you, Pastor Duane, for serving on that commission. In 2021, Reverend Jackson was elected into the position of vice president of the General Synod of the Reformed Church in America, and he concluded his service as our president from 2022 to 2023. And we're going to be talking a little bit. I know Dr. Angela has some good questions for you, Pastor Duane, about your time as president. He now serves as co-pastor of the Second Reformed Church of Hackensack, New Jersey, along with the Reverend Anna M. Jackson, his very own beloved wife. Reverend Jackson has promised to dedicate his life to preaching and teaching the uncompromised word of God to all the people of God and making disciples for Christ. We warmly welcome you to our podcast platform. Welcome, welcome. welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you both. 
Reverend Jackson has been involved in some significant work um, in the in um, the space where he is, as far as lifting um, the 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 light of the women who serve. And that is what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about some of the exciting ways that um, RCA is celebrating women. So actually, I'm going to start with Liz, and then we're going to bounce back to um, Reverend Jackson. So Liz, kind of explain, because you are also part of RCA, kind of mm -hmm. explain a little bit what is going on with RCA and women right now. Yes, well, we are in... Um, a, a, an exciting season. We are celebrating five decades of women in ordained ministry, starting back wow. in 1973. Wow. Uh, women ordained in, in our faith tradition, our Protestant faith tradition, uh, which is reformed. We have elders, deacons, and ministers of word and sacrament, three offices of the church. We also have a fourth office, professor of theology. But we're really focusing on especially those three offices that serve within the church. And it's it just is, been an exciting time. Mm -hmm. it, it, it is so exciting. And especially right now, when you consider that the, the focus for Women's History Month is focusing on those women who are breaking barriers yes. for diversity and inclusion and the work of justice. And so I think there's such a wonderful intersection that is happening within uh, the Reformed Church right now, understanding the importance of remembering the contributions and looking at the legacy that is being um, laid by the women who are part of this family of faith. So Reverend Jackson, tell me a little bit about how such a celebration could come about. That's a great question. Um, <laughs> I'll start out the way I always ask them all questions is by saying, I blame God. He, God <laughs> was the one that made it happen. Um, okay. So having served, well, I'll start out with having served with the Commission for Women. I had an opportunity to experience and hear their stories about how many of them struggled just to get through the educational process to become elders, deacons. And for my sisters who became ministers of word and sacrament, they really went through some pretty challenging times to get there. And when I listened to what they were doing, particularly in the geographic areas they were coming from, I then began to reflect back to my upbringing as a lifelong person of the Reformed Church in America. And in my home church in the Bronx, the men and the women both worked side by side. So there was never a time where I didn't know of elders or deacons or any restrictions on the offices women could have or the work that they would do. And so then you fast forward to now getting involved with the larger denomination. It just felt strange to see women having to stop or having glass ceilings put up or roadblocks or being told that you can't hold this position because of your gender. And, I, and so for me, I felt the need to have to use my voice and whatever positions I was in to open up those conversations because I've sat at tables, for example, where a woman was trying to say something and men would shut her down. So then I would just simply shut the man down and let her take my place while I say, I have something to say. Um, Pastor Liz, would you mind taking this? And that's how, you know, I tried my best to open doors and make ways. That's that's beautiful. That's beautiful. I, I know for a fact, though, that that can be a difficult place or position to find oneself in. Um, how or or did you, I, I don't want to assume, did you experience opposition as you were taking those stance in support of those sisters that God was calling and to, to serve and had a desire to, to be at the table? Yes, but I didn't care. Because the reality is that I've been dealing with that my entire life, not just as a man standing up for women, but as a black man standing mm -hmm. up for my own rights and knowing that I would be denied. And mm -hmm. so knowing that um, by going to bat for somebody who can't speak for themselves or whose voice is being marginalized or shut down, I, I know that I'd have to take on some of the onslaught. And I'm OK with that. I, I got a pretty tough skin. 
I love that. I love that. And, you know, and you speak to something that we talk about often with the fact that these, even as we talk about these various identities of being, whether it's gender or race or gender and race, um, the, the issues that, uh, that are related to oppression and um, this marginalization, they all really stem from the same place. Mm-hmm. Um, so when you begin to be able to address and, and be able to embrace one group, you can see how it's the same issue is being applied in another situation. And so again, um, that's that's part of why when we talk about this in, inter- in intersectionality, we believe as as we're as we're understanding how these things impact women and and in impact people are impacted by their race, um, it gives us an understanding of how we can begin to build bridges throughout our entire humanity, um, mm-hmm. addressing issues. We always talk about how do we address, how, how does, what does a word tell us about how do we treat the foreigner? How do we treat at, at one point in this society, those who might have been HIV positive were those who were pushed away, but mm-hmm. how do we become those to embrace those? Because we know, again, that was the uh, hallmark, I would say, of, of Jesus's ministry was that of being embracing and bringing those in from the margins. Mm-hmm. Um, well, that, that is really, that is really exciting. And, and part of, I'm interested to hear a little bit for you to tell us a little bit more about the process of, um, of being a champion, because one of the things that we do understand is that even as, as women or in any situation, you're, you need someone to champion for you. So um, w- as you've done that, what are some of the key things? I know you mentioned even as simple as um, acknowledging that someone has a voice and allowing their voice to be heard. What are some of the key things that you've done through these years um, that have helped women within uh, the Reformed Church to be seen, be heard, and, and uh, a- allowed to use their gifts that God has given them? Sure. Um Another great question. So I guess I'd have to start out by saying that all of the things that I went through to get me to the point where I was, and I'll I'll get to that point hopefully before the hour is up, kind of prepared me for that. So like realizing that with the titles that I was blessed to get or positions that I found myself in, it gave me the ability to speak into things in a different way. And so by starting out with my journey with the Commission for Women, that was a six-year journey on that commission where I had the opportunity to see, to hear, to experience some of the things that they were going through. And then by the time I was elected into the office of president for the General Senate of the Reformed Church in America, that gave me the opportunity to use the power that that position and title came with to open up doors and to make ways. And so by working with um, with Reverend Testa and some of the other women in the conversations when they were trying to get a space to acknowledge the women who have served as ordained women for the, for the five decades that we were looking at, one of the things they told me was, well, this is your general Senate and you can plan it the way you want. So I planned it the way I wanted. <laughs> I saw an opportunity to celebrate something that was near and dear to my heart. And that is the accomplishment of women who helped to shape and mold not only me, but the entire denomination. And the Reformed Church has a rich history of women doing work, both as um as missionaries as well as in the local churches. And so why not take the opportunity to make an opportunity to celebrate that, even in the midst of all that we're going through? And so that's I just spoke into those moments. And by the grace of God, with uh, minimal pushback, we were able to accomplish just that. I love that. And what an excellent um, example of how to use power. You know, we talk about power and privilege, but power and privilege in and of themselves um, are not necessarily a bad thing. It is how we choose to use them. And I love the fact that you're saying when given that opportunity, you use that to help benefit others. 
and help lift up others. That's that's beautiful. That's awesome. Well, Reverend Liz, let me ask you something. As part of the celebration, what have been some of the um, things that have gone on throughout this entire, because this, um, everyone, please understand, this is not just the month of March celebration. This is like a whole year <laughs> thing. <laughs> this is a big party. And I think it's going to be multi, multi-year, <laughs> actually. Yeah. I'm calling it a season. to stop yet. It's a season of celebration. <laughs> it's a season. That's what she's saying. <laughs> it's kind of like my daughter with her birthday, right? It's just a yeah. long, it's not a day anymore. It's a long celebration. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting because, so if we can just keep it real for a minute, the whole thing is we are celebrating, we are lifting up. It is the time. It is for such a time as this, that like our system can actually hold this and, and track with us Uh because we are in this moment. I think it's a critical moment. And it is, I think, no accident that not only was Reverend Jackson, African-American man who's already shared, right. How his own life experiences helped give him empathy for the plight of some women, Mm -hmm. but then also our general secretary, that is our, uh, like our president uh, or our CEO, CEO. if you will, our CEO. Um, So he's our staff, senior leader. Mm -hmm. He is uh, a Latino. So in this same, and he all often talks about some of the barriers that he's had to break and the challenges that he's faced. And so Reverend Eddie Aleman is his name. So we have Reverend Aleman unabashedly proclaiming we affirm women in office. We affirm we affirm women living into their gifts and callings in all the ways that God calls them. In that same moment that he was starting to get his language and able to be able to express himself clearly, this was the same moment that Reverend Jackson was our president. And so wow. the two of those men together were able to kind of stand in that gap and to be able to help to open, as you're saying, like you want to draw the circle wide so we can embrace everybody in. And they really help to kind of establish that and normalize it. And so that that has been one of the most joyful things for me is to see that in this season, also when our denomination is living into one of our goals is a multicultural, multiracial future freed from racism. We call this the Revelation 7, 9 vision, right? Mm -hmm. So we have Galatians 3 and 28 alongside Revelation 7, 9, all tribes and tongues. And again, this is aspirational in some places. We acknowledge that um, because we are, uh, I would still say like a majority white, quote unquote, right? The social construct of race, white, Mm -hmm. but Anglo, Northern European tradition. But we have a lot of diversity that is very much ready to sit at the table and many of whom have been for decades. And so again, God is, is helping us to draw the circle wider and embrace even more diversity in, and it's really a beautiful thing. So alongside this celebration of women, we also are being really intentional to make sure that we know like all of our different people groups, all of our different ethnic and racial backgrounds, all those women know this is also, we're celebrating you too. Even if you're first, like, you know, in California, our first Latinas that have been ordained as ministers of word and sacrament that happened a year ago, wow. <laughs> you're still counted in that number, right? Wow. So they're part of, this is a living legacy. And that's something that was so beautiful about um, this. Uh, we had a beautiful celebration, evening celebration with a reception following that Reverend Jackson used his, right, his presidential authority to be able to say, we'd like to do this. Um, We created a beautiful uh, celebration with music and prayer and Mm -hmm. story shared. And he said, you know, I'd really love it to have this movement of celebrating the past, the present, and then looking forward to the hope of the future. I love that. See, Dr. Angela, that's how you get everybody in the room. I love it. When you are doing that, Right. So even if we started with the first women that were ordained were necessarily white women, that's what it was. They were Dutch descent or Anglo women. Then you started having right. The rest start Mm -hmm. to come in. Right. We had our first 
it's, that was the seventies. Then in the eighties, you had first African American, then the first Asian. You know, the the Latinas coming <laughs> always a little yeah. later. Um, but but you had this beautiful kind of influx of, and then we had our beautiful Native American sisters are also counted in that number. So I, I think it's just a really beautiful, rich season for us, wouldn't you say, Reverend Jackson, of having this um this this intersectionality piece, uh, really being part of it. And I do believe we just had a big celebration that mirrored the one that Reverend Jackson helped us to create last year. We just did this in Michigan that had that past, present, future, and that feeling of embracing all the generations. Uh, that, that, that real, it, like it'll preach. I mean, it preaches, people love it. And it really helps get everybody uh, honored and included, especially in Western society that likes to be out with the old and with the new. We're sharing the continuum of yeah. the legacy. Yeah, yeah. And Reverend Jackson, do you mind just kind of speaking a little bit as well? So how does this, as we're celebrating all of the traditions, the various heritages that are represented in, in these different ethnicities coming together, but how does this, how does this speak to issues of justice and the role of the church in bringing into fruition, the justice that God says that he loves so much for his people. I'm a firm believer in the passage of scriptures that refer to saying that if one part of the body hurts, everybody hurts. Mm. And if one person is held down, we're all held down. Amen. And my feeling is that if we are serious about doing the work that God has called us to do, I can't spend my time trying to oppress my brother or sister because now it takes the focus off of what God has called me to do moving forward. And so to sit down and to have to actively exclude women from any part of our denomination puts me in a position where I can't do any work because I become a gatekeeper or a, or a warden. And so how am I going to go forward and do the work that I'm doing while I'm busy trying to oppress somebody else? So it's so much easier for me to take you by the hand and say, let's go do this together. Oh, that's good. So that, that's, that's, good. that's what drives me. Yeah. Yeah. And for me and where I worship, I uh, give leadership to our social justice ministry there. And one of the things that, just like you said, for me, I, I have to be concerned about the scriptures tell us to be concerned about the least of these, um, Celebrating is wonderful as well, but there's also that work that goes hand in hand with the celebration that we're doing because um, I get, you know, the the statement that Dr. King says, all the, is, that's attributed to Dr. King with that, you know, if there's uh, oppression anywhere, then there's all of us, like you just said, are experiencing oppression. So um, it's very important that we I believe as the church that we continue to stand in those places to speak out, right? To be that voice for those who can't speak for themselves. Absolutely. And to add a little bit more to that, you know, I love the celebrations. Celebrations mm -hmm. are great. Those mountaintop experiences are yes. always wonderful. You go home, you feel good. If you're lucky, mm -hmm. you get a little in the water, a trophy or something cute <laughs> to show for it. But for me, those become the starting points, not the mm -hmm. pinnacle that we strive for. So now that I'm hearing that that celebration brought to the attention of others who say, we need to do this too. And who knows what opportunities it will open up. And I love the fact that we did it across the age spectrum because nobody is going to not celebrate their mother. Yes. Nobody is not going to encourage their daughters. So true, though. I mean, we we have to have that peace, right? We have to tell the stories, and I I love that you both said that 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 time was made available in this celebration to lift these stories, these narratives, um, because if you don't tell them, they get lost. Mm -hmm. And yes. it's always said that if you don't remember your history, you you run the risk of repeating the mistakes of the past. You are so, condemned to repeat it. <laughs> that's it. That's it. And so, Whoa. you know, we have to yeah. um, keep those things at the forefront and remembering how we are progressing forward. So we yes. don't uh, go backwards. But one of the things that um, 
you you were just mentioning because you it right now you are you're serving as a senior pastor and your wife serves alongside of you is that my understanding co-pastoring together at the same church yes okay co-pastoring so let's talk about that let's talk about that a little bit like the the practical side of mutuality um in our sacred spaces um how how is that for you all how do you how has your congregation received that as well? It's been an interesting journey. Um, mm -hmm. It's been a challenge, both to us personally as well as professionally. But after having served apart in separate congregate parishes for um, quite a number of years, we both came to realize what our strengths were and what our weaknesses were, the things that we can do without and the things that we absolutely love to do. And so when we came to the realization that we wanted to give co-pastoring a try, we actually sat and looked at all the responsibilities within the church and divvied them up in that way. And so she loves doing the administrative stuff, conducting the governing board meetings and all that stuff. I told her to have at it. Um, me, I'm, I like walking the streets. I like going out and finding people to hang out with. So I go to community meetings and look for other ways of bringing the outside people into the inside of the church. And that. so for her, that's not really her thing, but it works together. Within the context of the church, when we first got here, we had to establish very clear boundaries with the members to let them know that we're equals, that we're not, mm. I'm not the senior pastor and she's not my associate. And so um, naturally what ended up happening was people tended to gravitate towards the one they feel more comfortable with. So when they want to speak to a woman, they go to her. When they want to speak to a male, they, they come to me. Um, some say that I'm the more sensitive of the two of us. And so I'm the one who keeps a box of tissues on my desk. <laughs> everybody comes into my office and cries. I don't know why. <laughs> Um, <laughs> and, and so, and so we've learned to function that way and we butt heads, of course, like any mm -hmm. other, um, clergy team slash spousal husband, whatever it does, because there are things that we both are passionate about. And that's mm -hmm. where you get to see the stubbornness in both of us. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. but we realized that by working together in this venue and in this context, we can accomplish so much more than either one of us could have done alone. I love that. That's so beautiful. And then when we talk about mutuality, that when you said we kind of sat down and, and looked at the task and how uh, our strengths speak to those tasks and kind of divvied, the, divvied it up that way, that's really what this is all about. Mm -hmm. You know, that's really what this is all about. It's it's not about uh, the hierarchies and and it is not about women taking control and domineering over men it's not that uh it's it's truly about how do we serve together based on the gifts that god gives us how he naturally equips each of us um to serve because you know the word says that we're created for the works he has for us to do so he's made us in specific ways to do some specific work mm -hmm. um so, so that's i love that uh and it's and it is interesting that you said how you had to also help your congregation yes yeah yes yeah um it's it's been fascinating because some of them will actually still refer to me as the pastor and that's okay you know i won't deny them that because they still need something to anchor on to but i won't let them deny her her title or position either yeah yeah yeah. And that's, and that is again, part of that, you know, um, what we talk about here in being intentional about bringing others in, uh, even as you're trying to widen the circle and, uh, helping, helping people to kind of reframe and retrain what they're used to experiencing and their understanding. So, Oh, you are very much so to be applauded and just super excited about all of this. Let's see, Liz, what am I, what am I missing here? I know there is well, more that we want. Well, something just in keeping with everything that you all were just talking about, just to talk about Reverend Anna Jackson for a second, mm -hmm. because it's so interesting. Like the, I'm always looking at what's the ripple effect, right? Just as, 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 as Reverend Dwayne was saying, like, we don't want it to be a one and done. So I'm just thinking about, so just as he was talking about 
you know, how he makes sure that the other Reverend Jackson has her space and is respected and such. So her, so her administrative gifting, she was the chair of the board of trustees of New York, uh, New Brunswick Theological Seminary, where my office is. It's where my studio is here. Um, and they adopted a plan to dismantle systemic racism uh, oh, wow. almost 20 years ago now. And so she was the moderator of the board of trustees when the time came to move from the then current president, Dr. Greg Mass, God rest his soul, who had been called, he was a man of Dutch descent, but who had done some work in South Africa during the apartheid movement. So he had some mm -hmm. skills and um, alongside you know, other leaders, they decided to tackle this. And so when it came time for him to uh, retire, they were then looking for a new president. And Reverend Anna Jackson was the leader of that movement, that effort. And wow. under her leadership, this seminary was able to bring in its first African-American president. So wow. within just like a decade's time, mm -hmm. and this is like, we've been around since the 1700s. Okay. <laughs> like this is mm -hmm. historic. Mm -hmm. And so they were able to not only do all the work that was necessary to have like, um, you know, the split, the student body was very diverse. Mm -hmm. I would say majority African-American, but the board was not the staff and faculty. So they did a whole movement to rectify that. Then they did a lot of anti-racism. They adopted a whole anti-racism statement. They just really engaged in the in the hard work. And then they got to the point where they were able to bring in the Reverend Dr. Micah McCreary, who is still our president yet today. And we're so blessed with him. But it was Reverend, it was Reverend Anna Jackson who led that. That's beautiful. And convinced him, Dr. McCreary, that this would be a hospitable space for him. Mm -hmm. And so, and we give her all that credit. So that's just an interesting, it's just kind of interesting as we're looking at where, right, where uh, mm -hmm. race, gender, and religion collide. It's mm -hmm. right here. And it's, again, just as we're doing today, having Reverend Jackson be our guest, it kind of turns it around in terms of here's a woman who's encouraged, equipped, and empowered to live fully into her gifts and calling. And then she is then in turn able to do historic trailblazing things that then, you know, impact that intersectionality in a whole other, in a whole other systemic way. That's pretty exciting. So I, I love to, I love to draw those lines, right. To just see how those connections happen. Yeah, yeah. that's beautiful. That really is. And it kind of goes back to what you said, Reverend Jackson, when, you're, when, when we first opened and I asked you, how did this come about? And you said, God did it. Mm -hmm. You know, it is the incredible, miraculous, mysterious ways that God works things out. And then we get to stand back and be amazed and mm -hmm. like, I see what you did there, God. I got it now. <laughs> I, I couldn't understand it first, but I'm seeing it. I'm it's coming clear. So yeah. um that that is incredible. Um one one other thing I did want to kind of uh we keep having this. I don't know, just discussion between Reverend Liz and I about uh, the issue of hierarchy. It seems like it's something that plagues all of humanity. You, mm -hmm. As you look across societies, we, we see um, how this idea of power and control and needs to dominate one group over another group, uh, it, it rears its ugly head in, in across the globe. And I'm just kind of curious from uh, your perspective spiritually, well, what do you think about that? And how, how, what is it that you think that God is calling us as believers to mm -hmm. do to address when we're seeing that, that kind of mistreatment? That's a, that's an interesting question. When I think about that, and I think about all that I've been through, I draw upon first what I went through in the corporate world and in the engineering world, um, being that somebody who's always been, I'll just say an overachiever, to put it nicely, and um, have always found myself in positions where I had to struggle to move up the corporate ladder, move up, you know, being a senior design engineer. Uh, the only black senior design engineer in a company, you don't get the same level of respect. And so you have to fight for that. And then when you finally get that position, 
then you have to um, figure out how to get your subordinates to respect that as well. Mm -hmm. And so then you move on to the next phase of my life. And now here we are in the church. And the church that we're in right now is a particularly challenging one for us, for me personally, because as much as I was, I made reference that I was born and raised in the South Bronx. And so my heart is for people who struggle because mm. my family has always been one. And then I'll just say we 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 made it out. And I don't mean it as a, a down to put down those who are there, but just to simply say that God blessed us to do well. And so now that I'm in that position, what do I do with that? Mm -hmm. And so a part of it is I want to continue to help to elevate those who I've left behind. But also now that I'm in a slightly different place to use where I am to first educate those who would look down upon me. So mm -hmm. when I came to this church, let me just back up for a minute. So the church that we're in right now is predominantly Anglo church. Um, it saw itself as being a very high-end, lucrative church. Financially, our church is set probably for till Jesus comes back. And so we have no issues with that. And mm -hmm. to be blunt and honest, I would say uh, 10, maybe 20, say 20 years ago, they wouldn't mm -hmm. have even looked at our resume because right. it was that type of a church. Right. And whatever changed their mind, whether it was the interim minister before us or they saw something in us that said, we need those two people to help us to move forward. So being in this position, I'm probably the first Black man that they ever talked to on an intimate level about life and how they view others and how they see others and to hear my story and to hear some of my experiences that I went through that they don't believe is true, you know, um, right. having right. been through issues with police and stuff like that, just simply because I was a young black man walking down the street. And then to be able to overcome those, to then talk to those who oppressed me, to help them to understand that what you did hurts. And mm. so being in this position that we're in right now, I believe that I'm at a point where I can speak into this and not just simply be looked at as that angry black man who's looking to get mm -hmm. over, but somebody who respects who you are for who you are and want the same in return. Mm -hmm. And so that that's where that comes in for me and where the church, I believe God is calling us to be, is to be that voice, that model, the ones that exemplifies how God calls us to live, to love one another, to respect one another. Um, I'd say almost all my sermons, um, I, I find myself pulling in the commandment to love the Lord your God and to love your fellow human being with no caveats and no distinctions. And if we can break through that boundary as a church, if we can learn to love and respect each other as a church, that should ripple out into the communities that we live in. And I know some of our folks um, struggle with that because they leave our church and then they go back home to a, an environment that won't hear it, but those seeds are planted. Yeah. And I think if we can at least send them out with that, we've done our job. That's beautiful. And, you know, I, I will affirm that you, I would say you even have little sprouts, not just the seeds, because on the, the couple of times, uh, Dr. Angela, when, when the Reverends Jackson had been out of town, they've invited me to come and fill their pulpit for them. And so I've gotten to know some of those folks and I see the heart, I see the heart that's beating, um, in that body. And I would say it is the things that you have been planting in them are already starting to sprout. And I, I see a genuine, I see, the, I see their affection for you and their respect for you both. And I also see that they are starting to live into some of the things that you would hope for them. And even against, right, what their environment might, might dictate or their upbringing might dictate that they are experiencing that transformation, right, that we know comes with you know, the transformation in Christ and discipleship, right? So it's really beautiful oh, to see glory that. Glory be to mm -hmm. God. Mm -hmm. that, is, that is what this is all about. Well, Dr. Jackson, our time is up, but thank you so much. Um, this has been such a pleasure and you're part of a great historical moment for us here <laughs> at Mutuality Matters. <laughs> Um, but thank you so much for sharing um, your experience, your wisdom. And uh, I, I told all of our listeners that this would be 
an experience that they would not want to forget. So I am so happy that you've had, that we've had this time to, to be together and to really just kind of glean from you. So thank you so much for being so open and forthright with us. Thank you. Thank oh, it was you, my pleasure. You, and thank you both for having me on and allowing me to be the first male on your <laughs> program. I, I'm excited and I hope I didn't ruin it for every other man that would come along behind <laughs> me if there are any. You set a high bar, sir. So just <laughs> yes, know that. Indeed. You did. You did. And for everyone who is listening with us today, thank you as well for joining and tuning in. And we just invite you to stay tuned to all of the new episodes that we have that go on with our, our incredible team of co-hosts. Um, in the meantime, we want to encourage you to go to the show notes and learn how you can follow and support all of our podcast family. And be sure to follow CBE Internet national on facebook and twitter you can go to our website at www.cbeinternational.org for even more content subscribe to our blog magazine and academic journal watch videos and listen to audio of past conferences and events and i must say we are getting ready for our next conference it'll be coming up in july yes. in denver colorado so mm -hmm. go online and get registered today um also go check out our bookstore where you can find a ton 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 of talented authors and subjects that will enrich your faith and equip you to use your god-given talents in leadership and service to the gospel for all regardless of gender, ethnicity, or class. Well, I am Reverend Dr. Angela Raven Anderson, and this is Reverend Liz Testa. And we are your co-hosts and we, uh, we, oh, I always almost forget this. We want to give a shout out to Landon, our support yes, tech. Thank you, Landon. Landon, and the whole, whole, whole team of CBE International. Yes. Thank you for all for making this podcast possible. We are Mutuality Matters. Thank you for listening. Mutuality Matters podcast, along with thousands of CBE's other resources and content, is available for free on CBE's website, which is possible because of donor support. Together, we can spread the message that God calls women and men of all cultures, races, and classes to share authority equally in service and leadership in the home, church, and world. Give today at cbe.today slash donate.